So hi, this is Stu and we're here for the Purple Valley Asana School again with Joey Miles and this time we're going to look at Triangle Mukha Kapada Paschimottanasana. I probably said that a little bit incorrectly but it's something like that. And uh, there's so much going on in this pose. It looks really simple but Joey is going to explain to us why it's not quite as simple as it looks. Okay, so we've asked uh, Neil here to do the pose as beginners often do. So if you just glance from behind at the posture, what we start to see is the, the raising of the right sitting bone everything essentially collapses across here. You can see that uh, this left side of the pelvis is higher than the right. So we're going to start to essentially explore what's going on in the Virasana leg, hip, knee, uh, ankle and foot. So we'll take a look at that now. If you just cut, we'll change angle. The entry of the pose, a student will tend to start in Dandasana. Just lean to the uh, left when you're ready. Just lean to the left and start to fold the right leg back now. Pause there. If you start to look at this movement, what's happening is the thigh bone starts to rotate in as he brings the foot around. So just continue with that movement. That's great. Okay. Now it's normally at this point that we start to come up against some difficulty, mostly because of the stiffness here at the hip and whether or not this will rotate in. Now that's normally the starting point where people think it's problematic. Actually, we also are experiencing generally a lot of tightness uh, here in the knee, across the front of the quad, and especially here in the foot and the ankle. I don't know if you can see the angle, you might need to shift up slightly, but if we look here, can we see this angle here of the, um, the side of the leg or the shin coming down here, and then this part here, the foot's going in. Ideally, we should look for a straight line here. So if we take a closer look at this angle here along the uh, outer calf and shin, moving to the foot, in an ideal world what we're starting to look for is equal length here at the outer ankle and the inner ankle. You can see there's a lot less space here, a lot more uh, space there. So we're looking for something along the lines of this movement. Okay? So actually a lot of that stiffness has got very little to do with the hip, it's more to do with the top of the foot, the ankle itself. So we're now going to uh, explore a couple of variations for, for how to work on the feet and the ankles. So to explore the uh, tightness that we all have in the junction of the ankle, top of the foot, we're going to uh, use a, a little loop. So if you create a, a, a loop with the belt, and the, um, the belt, like Neil's doing here, goes around the ankles, be careful when you tighten the belt to do two things. One is to make it very tight, and the other is to just adjust. So if you just slide it slightly, we want to make sure that the, the metal buckle doesn't actually make contact with the, the skin here or the flesh of the feet or the ankles just because it gets uncomfortable. The other thing is to make sure that it is particularly tight. Okay? Now, the other thing we do is we take a folded blanket. It should be one of these relatively firm cotton blankets, ideally. We just create a loop and a roll. Sorry, the loop was for the belt, just a roll. Okay. Now if you face me, okay. we place this beneath the junction of the ankle. So if you raise your feet momentarily, okay, I'll move that out of the way, exactly. Okay. And then sit back on the heels. Now, when you're doing this, what uh, will tend to happen okay, is that um, without realising it, you'll move your head and your chest forward. Okay and we want to avoid that. So just slightly lean back, tiny bit, yeah. You don't even need to lean back that far. So if I just demonstrate, often when I'm teaching this to students, because they uh, encounter the discomfort, they start doing this already, okay? So you just avoid that, okay? You don't need to overly tilt the pelvis forward. Now when you're doing this at home, stay for as long as you can, several minutes, okay? And the next thing Neil then does, variation two, is to shift forward. When we shift forward, if you observe, forward a tiny bit, we now place the uh, metatarsals, this mid-area here, on the edge of the blanket and then again adjust the buttocks back to the heels. This, I warn you, is the variation that's uh, slightly tricky. Okay? If you interlace the fingers and just extend the arms behind your back slightly, chin up. Yeah, just stay like that. Okay? This starts to move the shoulder blades into the uh, back of the rib cage, move the top of the sacrum in. Keep allowing the weight of the head, the chest, the pelvis to drop down on this stiffness in the junction of the ankles and the top of the feet. Again, bear with this for as long as you can, and the telltale signs that you're not bearing with it well is that the mouth starts to clench, or the tongue starts to push into the teeth, or you lose your sense of humour. Okay? And then finally, we're going to do it a little quick, okay? but if you just come up, just lean forward, we now remove the blanket and take a minute here. Now the nice thing is, just sit back, exactly the same, this area here now should have become a lot length, uh, a lot longer from the second variation. Try to relax the feet and relax the toes. Uh, just copy me for a moment. 
sometimes we can actually use the thumbs to push this area down near the little toe. If I just scan around here again, the tendency when we observed before for the stiffness and that sickling of the ankle is for this part to lift up. Okay, so the tendency is for this to lift up when there's stiffness there. Okay, so sometimes just this pressure here down is very, very helpful. I'll often, when I'm adjusting people, actually use the um, big toe here as I'm then continuing to adjust in the triangle muckle because it adjusts the foot. Okay, this detail of the, uh, the feet and the stiffness in the feet and the ankles is normally overlooked massively. Now the final variation, if you can um, bear with it more, is to just lean forward, tuck your toes under, curl the toes under, sit back on the heels. Okay. And again, relax here for uh, ideally a couple of minutes. Okay, so we've uh, explored some of uh, the stiffness and the range of motion in the foot and the ankle. However, most people as they come into the pose, the most common experience of difficulty is discomfort here around the knee. And it's for this reason that people often feel pressure uh, in the knee or tightness in the knee that people often move the knee out to the side slightly. Now, that's absolutely fine. Okay, within reason, it's not injurious to move the knee a little out. Okay? However, the, the problematic quality with this is that by moving the knee out, we don't actually address the stiffness. So there's two things we can do, uh, but we need to know where the stiffness is coming from. Often it's coming from the quadriceps, from the muscles at the front thigh. Okay? And for this reason, I'll often ask people, if you just lean back on your hands slightly, okay, I'll often just ask people to move to this area. Okay? As soon as they move back a little bit, there's a, a classic way in which people now avoid this tightness in the thigh. Not that people are doing it deliberately, but they do it by um, uh, anteriorly tilting the pelvis or going into a back arch. So if you end up like this, before you know it, people can end up with their back on the floor and yet they're still not working into this area. So we want to look for thighs relatively parallel and then we need to, uh, as you push into your hands, lift the buttocks slightly and move here this area that way. So we're tilting. It's as if we're moving the coccyx towards the back knee and then that should bring you into the tightness here. Okay, in the front thigh and the hip flexor. Okay? When this starts to um, uh, lengthen and relax, it essentially softens and at that point you'll see the pelvis here it starts to drop down. Because in this pose, the buttock is actually going this way, down. Does that make some sense? You're following? Okay, is that clear? Okay, now, there's another thing that happens, which is when this thigh comes into contact with the calf, we need this calf muscle here to become very, very soft because ideally we want this pelvis or this left side of the pelvis to be uh, completely balanced with the right. Now, we need to take that with a pinch of salt because if we have uh, the lower leg and the thigh, whereas here we just have the thigh, this is almost inevitably going to be bigger. So when we're stretching back right now, we're looking to essentially soften these tissues, soften these tissues in order to get this to drop down. Okay? Now, the next adjustment people classically tend to make is this. If you come forward, lean way over to the side. Now here, as people lift, a useful adjustment and a common tendency, which is generally helpful, is to start to uh, slide the back of this uh, calf muscle away from the back of the knee to create space. What often people do, which is uh, perhaps a little bit uh, injurious or less functional, is they move the entire muscle here, uh, both heads of the gastro, way out to the side this way. Now that tends to actually pull on this knee. So what we need to think of doing, if we um, uh, just go into a little bit more detail, is we create space here from the back of the knee, and we're sliding the flesh um, of, the, of the gastro at the back of the calf down. And here, this outer belly of the muscle rolls out, but we don't want to pull uh, this inner belly right over. Okay? So from here, sliding back, we now adjust the thigh and the buttock down. The buttock's going to come down in this way. As Neil now comes down onto the pelvis and the sitting bones, we see that the uh, left sitting bone is in fact coming to the ground. But you can see already from this angle there's more weight on the right than the left sitting bone. So we have to slightly, with your fingertips both sides, either side of the thigh there, we just have to slightly, uh, other sit bone, uh, other hand that way, you just need to slightly shift to your left, okay, because we're wanting the weight to drop here. It's from this place if there's no discomfort in the front left knee, the bent knee, we can proceed to going forward. Let's just pretend for a moment, not that there is, but a little pain or discomfort at the back of the knee. Just allow yourself to lift the pelvis, okay? Lift your pelvis right up. We just slide in a lift here. As soon as we slide the lift, that creates space around the back of the front knee. And now from here we go forward. Exhale, inhale, extend up. 
extend up with straight arms, pause there. This is the place everybody needs to stay longer because it's from here with the chest up away from the thigh that we can now firm up the straight leg and suck the head of the thigh bone back and in. There's inner rotation of the thighs, but the most important thing is to lift and suck here, the right thigh, back and in. Okay, keeping this firmness here, I'm slapping him on the upper outer right thigh. So the greater trochanter, this upper outer thigh, knobbly bit of bone there moves inward. Here's where the grip has to be. We now want to become incredibly aware of the straight leg. So over here, the right toes, they're pointing up towards the ceiling. Okay, so the thigh, you have to spin from the outer thigh inward, the inner groin down here, it descends. This area here of the upper outer thigh needs to become sharp, particularly here at the greater trochanter, it's got to move inward. Okay, so most people, this is the area where there tends to be a, a falling out away from the midline. If this falls out away from the midline, you simply can't get the descending energy back here in the left sitting bone. From the previous angle, we were talking a lot about how we have to get heavy on the left sit bone, left side of the pelvis has to be moving down. It's all going to be coming in terms of effort from this area. This is where I tend to beat my students. <laughs> so you keep this firm. He's got tone here and there's contraction here in the quadriceps, the front thigh muscle group. And once he's got the lift, keeping this action here, now you go forward. Now that Neil has the work and the activation of the straight leg thigh, and now that we have the sitting bones grounded, if we start to explore here in the lumbar muscles, we can see um, some asymmetry, but what we've got, because of the grounding here, is we're extending on both sides. Now, the interesting thing is, is if you look here, there's, there's this difference between the two, but you want to now pay close attention in the pose as to looking for a, a feeling of symmetry. If this starts to lift up and you go that way, just let yourself lean, then again what you start to see is there's no extension here. So the, the muscles here which are anchoring down into this part of the pelvis, there's now uh, an inability to, to spread and lengthen. You can see this is lifting up, so this is basically in effect doing nothing. So everything we've been working so far is to get this to ground down partly for the uh, cleansing that goes on in the left leg, but a lot of the time it's here for the back. The final thing I tend to look for is the positioning of the head. Mm -hmm. okay? So because of the slightly crude instruction, chin to shin, people will tend to go veering off towards the right side um, and generally will take the head too low, as I've asked Neil to do here. So the first thing uh, we do to correct this is come higher, raise the head slightly up. In fact, bring your hands to your foot here so you're not tending to go so low. Now, try to line up the spine with the space between the thighs, or often the instruction I give to overcompensate for people is line up your spine with your left thigh bone. So move forward in the direction of the left thigh bone and pause. Try to become aware of this area of the base of the skull here. Now line up approximately the base of the skull, so I'm almost lifting him here around the occiput area, with this area of the top of the back. So go a tiny bit more forward, a bit more forward and stop there. So I don't really, you can even see here, this is getting to be slightly lower than here. I tend to, on the in-breath, almost imagine there's a, like a helium balloon or a helium quality there rising. Then the crown of the head starts to go forward. Notice now he's not touching the face to the shin. No. And generally what occurs here, when you allow yourself to not go so low, is you never collapse. Then, it's like looking in the rear view mirror, you maintain this work back here from the grounding in the pelvis and from the work here in the right side bone. Yeah. Because all of his chest is down on his thigh, it's just Abs not curving. Absolutely, he's not rounding the upper back so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And that, that and if I can, can ask you about, legs. yeah, if I can ask you about this bent leg. Sure. As to how much you feel it needs to medially rotate at the hip. Because we can see from the angle of the knee that it, it's, it has done this, it has rotated in. And I hear some instructions saying, you know, very minimal medial rotation. But if you don't immediately rotate it, then you tend to talk your... Talk the knee. Talk the knee more. But then also you don't want it... I've seen it also on some students that it's almost so rolled out that somebody could actually lay their foot out on the side. And that's also too much, isn't it? Absolutely it is. So the thing about the positioning of, of the, the hip is obviously we have this inner rotation. But my own experience tends to be that what I'm up against is actually tightness in the musculature of the legs, mm. okay, as opposed to actually there being an inhibition of the, the thigh to rotate, rotate in. in. Okay. Like, so what tends to be the inhibition tends to be the fact that you know, these are bulky muscles that we walk around on all mm. day long. The other thing that's worthy of mention, though, on a similar note here, is the fact that um, 
you know, classically, people place the knees together. Okay? And even if we look uh, in the texts like um, uh, Light on Yoga, he says knees together. Right. What you have to remember, particularly if you glance at me from here, is men tend to have pretty narrow hips. Yes. Okay? Now, most women who have broader hips, or often some men as well, they're actually, if we're looking for the thigh bones to be more parallel, there needs to be a small gap here between the knees. Yeah. And again, this tends to uh, uh, help massively. So you, that would maybe be a nicer instruction, thigh bones parallel. Thigh bones parallel. Thigh bones together. parallel. I often ask mm. people, in fact, I normally say, allow there to be a, an inch or two between the knees. Once people are going out this way, I tend to ask them to sit up higher on the lift right. as opposed to um, uh, just bring it in uh, unnecessarily. You know, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's one of the things I look for. And for those people that have had an, an issue with their knee, or maybe yeah. an ongoing issue with the knee, and they're disinclined to get as deep as into this sort of posture. Is yeah. there a variation that they could do that? The pose which is neglected, which is right. not in the Ashtanga primary series, right. which we have to explore in more detail, is Virasana. Yes. Okay. The Virasana is essential. So in answer to Stuart's question, for somebody who finds the Virasana very difficult, I'll always introduce a blanket or a lift of some variety. Okay. As we fold, uh, in this case, the left leg into Virasana, and I re-show you how I slide the uh, calf back, not moving the whole thing over, which would create a uh, uh, talking of the knee slightly, but as I slide that out ahead to create space there back, the next movement that I'll always do is here, I bring my fingers close to the shin, and if you watch, I adjust the skin here forward. You see? Okay. That frees up the quadricep here, okay? Then I just ask people to tend to work here, often just staying in an upright position. Here, Many times people find they can work the pose, okay? Or possibly here they can work the pose. As they go forward, it's often when there's a sense of collapse that we start to get a, a, a bit of a problem, take more, take more pressure, yeah. exactly. Okay. And, and what about the full, I know we're taking a little bit of a diversion here, yeah. but we don't tend to get a chance to open up the, the front, front of the pass. thighs, much, Absolutely. do we? So yeah. I know a lot of teachers suggest maybe doing the full virasana or supta virasana on the Absolutely. sort of daily basis as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, working Virasana, which I can show you. It's the two-legged version. If I just work the Virasana here, and then often in the um, uh, afternoon classes when we're doing restorative work, pranayama work, uh, the Supta Virasana, which is going back on the bolster here. Yeah. And then holding, of course, the pacing of that's very different. We hold for five, ten minutes at a time. Yeah. yeah. And so for those people in the Supta Virasana that can, it can put a bit of pressure on the lumbar spine. Absolutely. Can't it? Yeah. So either, as you suggest, maybe a bolster, or is there an adjustment of the pelvis that can make it a little bit more comfy? So exploring Supta Virasana on this journey within Triangle Mukha, um, <laughs> if I'm now sitting in the um, Virasana shape, and you can see here, uh, hopefully, the line from the shin to the outer foot, what I'm now going to do is to maintain this grip of the outer ankle inward, I've again taken the, the loop of the strap and I bring it here. Often people think that's to stop the knee sliding out. When I use it, um, obviously it, it depends on the, the person, but actually what I'm tending to use it, you can see I've deliberately positioned it at the outer ankle. It's keeping the outer ankle moving inward. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Now, when I um, lie back on a bolster, uh, often when we haven't been trained, People th tend to use the, the props like their furniture, like we sit on a sofa or something. Actually, that's really not what it's there for in the slightest. So there's two things here. I haven't put the bolster right up against the sacrum. Okay? I'll always place a little gap here. Now as I start to ease back, I might only go halfway and I'll pause. Now this is the bit that's quite interesting because now the pose becomes more active. What I do is I push into the hands. I actually lift my buttocks deliberately off the ground we're talking a millimetre, but you'll see this whole area will slightly lift. And I'll draw the coccyx towards the back of the knees. So I'm actually having to slightly uh, squeeze around the buttock muscles at this point. And now I try and uh, lay the lumbar and the back of the ribcage down towards the uh, bolster slightly. You see, if I were to relax, you'll see the pelvis would just do that. Can you see the front ribs rise? Okay. So I'm actually, I'm pushing into my elbows again, and I do that movement there. Yeah. You see? And I'm having to maintain that action as I start to go back. Okay. Now, as I bring in uh, a blanket, in this case it could be a foam block for the head, I now want to check that my forehead is slightly higher than the chin, which is also chin slightly higher than the chest, which is slightly higher than the pelvis. Okay. And now we would rest in such a way here. 
and then we essentially have to wait for this area to, to start to release and it will take quite some time so often the, this is the point where I'll use a timer for five minutes okay now another option because often this uh, compression at the sacral lumbar joint still occurs. Another option when we go back, this assist in the pelvis, is this. We take the, the blanket, in this case, underneath the knees. Yes. Okay, and then we go back. Now, this has sort of neutralized the pelvis for me. So I can start to go there. back. Mm. And you can see this is less opening here. But mm. for many people, that again takes the pressure out of the knees. Mm. There are, when you start using props, endless variations. And you have to really experiment to find what works for you because for some people the stiffness is in the belly, the thigh, others the hip flex, others in the abdomen, others in the actual uh, the knee joint itself. You see yeah. others the top of the feet like we've explored. So yeah. there's a complexity to this pose which is um, uh, going to give you a, a, a lot to explore. Great stuff. Thanks so much, Joey. And, uh, you know, so much detail, but, you know, this is what we need to be thinking about in these postures. It is making it for the individual, don't we? Adjusting Absolutely. what is, what is it, where do you feel it yourself? Not what the person next to you is doing, but what can I manage in my own posture? Yeah. Can I mention one last mm. thing? Because I it. can't resist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so many people uh, have this concept, and it's, it's a normal concept to have, that a, a posture progresses you for the next pose in the series. Um, it's been my experience that actually perhaps it works the other way around. <laughs> so sometimes the whole purpose of doing the, the, what we might call intermediate or advanced postures, the whole purpose is that they teach you the actions. In fact, they force the actions for the simpler poses. So actually, my appreciation of the simpler poses has really grown from doing the more complex ones. So if I take a pose like Triangle Mukha, okay, and often as we go forward I see people collapsing, I like often to ask people to do uh, crown chasana. Yes. Okay. So by doing the crown chasana here, okay, we could be using a strap or we could yeah. be using the foot. Now, this leg has to be active. So before when uh, Neil was doing the pose, I was slapping him on the outer thigh. But if I work here, this directionality of pulling the thigh bone down, this occurs. Nobody doesn't do the action here. Yeah. Whereas as soon as we come to this position, what tends to happen is instead of the thigh bone moving this way, it collapses forward and out, you see. So if I want this grounding it. here in the sit bone, if I work the crown chest in a shape and I feel the action, I just have a, a, a sense of muscle memory as I go forward in the triangle mukha. Yeah. So actually what I'd say is, is it's not so much triangle mukha prepares you for crown chest, but rather we can reverse it, crown chest can prepare us for, for triangle mukha. Mm, yeah, and even like Bekasna can give us some of the stuff that Absolutely. they're then doing. Absolutely, Bekasna yeah. is the Virasana, yeah. it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Great. Thanks, hope that helps.